Earlier this season, Brian Palish, who was then still with ASCE, American Society of Civil Engineers, came on the show and talked about infrastructure to include water. I'm sure a number of you listened to that episode and heard Brian, he and I talked about it. Clean water isn't important until you don't have it. A water expert joins us in this episode to take a deep dive, sorry about that, into the world of water. You don't want to miss it. Hello from Frigid, I mean ice cold Austin, Texas. It's like 30 degrees feels like here at the moment and the temperatures are plunging. I'm Bill Colhane, the host of The Big Bid Theory. Rick Jennings is making the magic happen as always. In this crazy bit, it has to do with water in a sense. In crazy bits, we're going to be talking about snow removal. Rick, see you back there bundled up. Yesterday was fall. Today is winter. How are you holding up? You know, Bill, just uh, considering this weekend where we were just enjoying weather in the mid-70s, um, I saw the forecast that we were going to approach the low 20s tonight, and my jaw just about dropped. But um, that's just Texas weather, and um, I guess we'll just prepare. Is enough being done in the U.S. to manage and provide water? That's just one of the questions coming out of this topic. We talked about in our production meeting yesterday, we've seen that many government agencies are requesting and investing in water treatment, water systems, you name it. Right. So if we look at treatment plants as a whole um, for treating wastewater and stormwater and such, of course, there's a lot that goes into their day-to-day operations. And uh, just looking at the Bid Prime database, of course, um, it looks like the government is putting out a lot of calls to assist with these operations. Uh, most of what you'll find really helps them directly with what they're trying to do and mostly providing chemicals to help treat this water, also for uh, odor control, which is very important. Um, But it is also important to uh, kind of view these uh, stations as a place where government employees will um, stay in and do work most of the day. So, of course, you'll find um, some more commonplace um, opportunities such as uh, janitorial custodial services, maybe repair and maintenance, things like that. So there's definitely a lot that goes into um, just the operation and uh, day-to-day functions of these treatment plants. And uh, hopefully we'll get to learn a little bit more about um, their core functions and what they do um, in today's episode. That's true, Rick. I say it all the time. Governments request and purchase anything and everything, the number one customer in the world. Now it's time for our guest. Todd Danielson from the city of Avon Lake, Ohio, joins the show in a moment. But first of all, tell you a little bit about him. Todd has worked for the Loudoun County Sanitation Authority, Loudoun Water in Ashburn, Virginia. He's also served as a manager of community systems, process engineer, and environmental engineer. His credentials, take a quick look here. Todd is a professional engineer in both Virginia and Ohio, certified environmental engineer, American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists. You look at his education, he has a master's of public administration from George Mason, an MS in environmental engineering from the University of Texas, right here in good old Austin, Texas. Hook them. And speaking of snow and cold temps, a BS in civil and environmental engineering from the University of Maine. If you think clean water isn't all that important, well, now's the time for you to exit stage left. But if you think clean water is a good thing, here's our visit with Todd Danielson. We now connect on the Big Bid Theory hotline with Todd Danielson from Avon Lake up in Ohio. Todd, we appreciate you joining the show. Well, thank you for having me. I gave a little bit of your background as a lead-in to this segment, Todd, but for the benefit of our audience, you'll do a far better job than I ever could hope to do. What exactly is it that you do at Avon Lake Regional Water? Sure. Well, Bill, I'm the chief utilities executive, and and what that really means is I work with the staff uh, to help the board implement its policy and set strategic direction. The longtime listeners to the show understand that we report, we converse about a variety of topics. As a matter of fact, we had Dr. Bathin on our last episode. We talked about education. We've also talked about terrorism. We've talked about IT, cybersecurity, a number of different topics on here, and 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 some are I guess, closer to my heart than others. And water treatment happens to be something that I've reported on previously. Back when the Flint, Michigan story first came out, I talked about that. But I also 
have a personal anecdote as well, where back in the early 2000s, I guess it was 2002, I traveled to Papua New Guinea. And one of the things that we did during our trip is we went out to various islands there in Milne Bay, which is the eastern part of Papua New Guinea, for those who don't know the geography. And one of the, the saddest moments of my life, one of the saddest things I've ever experienced is you got to these small, tiny islands there in and around Milne Bay, and you had these people living on islands surrounded by water. And we visited with one of the local authorities, and he talked about the problem they have there in Papua New Guinea with these people not having clean water available, people dying because they don't have water available and they're surrounded by water, just absolutely terrifying. And that has stuck with me for the longest time. Why is it, Todd, that you got involved in the water industry? You know, I guess there are a lot of different reasons why, Bill, why I got involved in water, but I grew up in Maine. And growing up in Maine, you know, water is is very really near and dear to everybody because it's right there. Uh, I, I lived mm-hmm. on a lake. You know, I enjoyed s- swimming. I enjoyed you know hiking in the woods and seeing the streams and and you know skiing. You know, you got, you got to ski downhill ski or or whatever <laughs> <laughs> when you're in Maine. So uh, water is just all around me, and so it's just part of me. I think. You look at every industry across the U.S., and it, it does not matter what industry you're talking about, but every industry has challenges of varying significance. For those of you in the water industry, what are two or or maybe three challenges that are forcing you and your peers to really roll up your sleeves and and address these, these issues, these challenges? Sure, Bill. Thank you. Well, I think that that you know we we suffer from our own successes and and over the years whether it was through the the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Clean Water Act or just going way back into history we put in you know an incredible system of infrastructure across the United States which has worked so incredibly well um, but then what's happened is is we have not renewed it as we should. And we have the issue of aging infrastructure with significant capital requirements and unfortunately insufficient rates or revenues to to really replace what we should because we've been basically snow plowing it down the road for a long time. So that's really, I'd say, the first challenge. Um, and then when you add on top of that, right now, you know, you talked about Flint. Uh, but you know, currently in in the news, the, one of the big things right now is PFAS, the the per and polyfluoro alkylated substances, and 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 there's just all this. You know, I might go so far as to say hysteria out there, you know, with things being driven on fear and not science on on what really is safe and what's not safe because nobody, you know. I, I guess the information is getting out there before the science is out there, and, and people are are afraid that you know anything that they ingest could kill them. I thought it was interesting, Todd. Uh, the very first part of your response, you, you talked about infrastructure. At the start of this segment, and I promise our audience, this wasn't pre-rehearsed at all between Todd and myself, but I mentioned that Brian Pallas from the American Society of Civil Engineers was on the show back in April. And one of the things that Brian talked about is exactly what you hit on, hit on, Todd, where there's so much in our infrastructure of which water is included that we're just, you know, putting it off, putting it off. And yes, the infrastructure is getting old and there are certain aspects of infrastructure that is failing. So on that note, in one of our pre-production communications, you mentioned sewer separation. What is it? And why is it a good thing? I did a little, after you sent that email back to me, I did a little bit of research and it got me interested, it got me thinking, but uh, what exactly is it? Sure. Well, and, you know, going back to the whole comment and, and discussion about infrastructure, um, as, as you and, and I'm sure all of your listeners know, I mean, water and wastewater infrastructure is primarily buried. It's primarily underground, you know, the distribution and collection systems. And as a result of that, uh, you know, people don't necessarily want to put a lot of money into it because it, it's you don't see it. <laughs> you don't really realize the benefit of it. I mean, yes, you, you turn on the tap and, and the water flows or you flush the toilet and, and, the, and the wastewater goes. Um, but but it, it's so hard for politicians to want to invest in infrastructure. Um, now, that being said, Avon Lake, you know, here where I am, as well as well over 800 communities, I think it's 860 if I remember correctly, communities in the United States were what were called um, 
or primarily are called combined sewer communities. Um, a combined sewer system is, is where wastewater and stormwater combine in one system. Uh, during the dry periods, you know, all of it goes to the wastewater treatment plant uh, or water reclamation facility as, as they're starting to be called. Uh, in the wet periods, uh, typically, uh, it could flow directly to some sort of receiving body. Uh, here where I am, it's Lake Erie, uh, but it could be a stream, it could be a river, it could be just about anything. Um, now, uh, back uh, in 1972 with the Clean Water Act, that really ended the ability to continue putting in combined sewer systems. And it also established the plan for helping to prevent um, combined sewer overflows. But, but 1972 was 47 years ago, and many communities are still in the process of dealing with combined sewer systems. Our community, um, Avon Lake, we agreed back in 2004, uh, we agreed with Ohio EPA that we would completely separate our sewer systems. And that's not what most people are doing. Um, primarily like bigger cities and, and others, um, uh, they're putting in maybe wet weather storage. Uh, they could be the big underground tunnels that, that are you know tens or hundreds of millions of dollars or, or, or maybe ponds or other things that, that could hold the combined wastewater, the stormwater and the wastewater. We are completely separating our system, and we actually have a due date of the end of this year, and we will be separated. We, we will be um, one of the first in Ohio um, to have completely separated our sewer systems, which is – we're really excited about that. Um, but it leads into all these other questions that uh, probably too deep for the, for this conversation. But you know, how do you worry about separating uh, water and, and stormwater, wastewater and stormwater on private property and other things like that? So we've been dealing with that for a number of years, and uh, we are excited that we are wrapping up this first part of sewer separations. Yeah, for, first part, and it's interesting you, you say that, Todd, because it, it looks like there are other places in the U.S who are in various phases of, of having similar projects. I see here, I see a combined sewer separation project, I guess, going on. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. It's either Newark or Newark, Ohio. Uh, the city of Dearborn, Michigan has a storm sewer separation project and it looks like another project related to this in, in the city of Des Moines up in Iowa as well. So, so other other uh, public sector a entities are are involved in those projects as well. It'll be interesting to see if it takes uh, in other parts of the U.S. as well. Now, in the intro to the episode, I mentioned that you have an MS in environmental engineering from the University of Texas. So while being a Maine native, you're familiar with the Central Texas area, and so I'm sure you are aware, Todd, that we have seen enormous growth along the I-35 corridor from north of Austin all the way down to San Antonio. I've been in this area for 30 years. It's incredible to see the growth that's gone on in this area. I know you're familiar with the Edwards Aquifer that we have uh, providing much of the water to the citizens in this area, but we're not alone. In what ways have you seen population shifts impacting the availability of clean water in the United States? Well, you you already you know, kind of said that, Bill, in a sense, in that um, where the population seems to be moving, it seems to be moving to water stressed areas. Um, you know, whether it's like Austin or you know the Florida area or, or much of, of the warmer parts of the country, you know, there there's there's so much stress going on, and uh, with water, that is uh, probably other things too, uh -huh. but. Sure. Uh, you know, the, the issue at hand is is the way we had historically thought about this, you know, goes back to when, when we really didn't treat it too well. So it was always that once through mentality. Um, so so you, you get the water, you treat it, you drink it, you flush it, you treat it, and you send it on its way somewhere else. And that mentality just does not work anymore, um, especially in, in these growth areas. Um, so, so I, I think uh, you know, water professionals are starting to to go through this either fit for purpose type of thoughts, whereby uh, water gets used, treated, and reused in, you know, in, in certain levels, or some other ways to, to try to best manage the water, 
Or the other aspect is is areas like where I am. I'm, I'm in the Great Lakes region, and we have a lot of water up here. Um, now, I'm not trying to say we should waste any of that water, but but um, I, I think that over the next you know several years, there will be shifts either in population or in industry to better put uh, industry where the water is. A lot of a lot of multinational corporations um, are putting water stress as part of their annual reports and their and their thinking on what they want to do. Because water is important. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, there of course it's the overused statement that water is life. Uh, but um, you know, there are several people that that are out there that that clearly understand. In everything you do, water is necessary. You know, you're making semiconductors. Water is necessary. Obviously, if you're making beer or soup or anything else, water is necessary. Uh, you know, and and of course, living. <laughs> you know, we we would not live without water. Yeah, yeah. And Brian Tallis again. I mentioned Brian when he was on back in April. Uh, one of the comments that he made, and I, I got a chuckle out of it, but but Brian talked about, you know, water is not important until you you don't have any. You know, right. you go to get water and it's not there. Then it's really important. So, yeah, I believe uh, Ben Franklin had a, had a famous quote about that uh, with respect to, you know, we, we learn the value of water when the, when the well runs dry. Yeah, okay, that's very well said. We'll, we will use that one as well. And you got Rick's attention when you said that water – is needed to make beer that made his eyebrows <laughs> his eyebrows rise here in the studio. But final thing, and yeah, this is really not that there's been pressure previously, but this is the no pressure question because you know we're not going to go back and grade anybody two, three, five years down the road. But as you look ahead to the next few years, and maybe you just touched on it a little bit, but in your opinion, what's ahead for the water industry? Well, I think that the water industry is in many ways, you know, that that second word right there, industry. We are are moving away from a governmental mentality to more of an industrial mentality or a business mentality. Uh, you know, those, those words, you know, can be taken either positively or negatively. Um, but what what I'm trying to say is that we're taking on a lot of the concepts that were used in business and industry, uh, whether it are things like continuous improvement uh, or things like you know the whole you know uh, Internet of Things uh, with respect to data analytics and and uh, you know whether it's for assets you know, you know managing your your system or or managing usage understanding leakage there there are so many ways that that we are moving along that whole technological highway that everybody else is Todd on behalf of our entire audience and everybody here at the show we appreciate so much you sharing your expertise all the best to you and our friends up there in avon lake ohio thank you bill i really appreciate your time today go to the description of this episode for more details on todd and a, a few of the topics we discussed again many many thanks to todd danielson from avon lake ohio it's now your favorite time of the month. I know everybody sits around waiting for the next episode of the Big Bid Theory to come out. Lauren found this trend, and we're going to call it crazy bids because the numbers are crazy. At the top of the show, Rick and I were lamenting the fact it's so cold in Austin today. I think in the past 10 minutes, the temperature has gone down another few degrees. In a few days, temps are going to be back in the 60s and 70s here in Austin, and we'll get the shorts back out. However, there are many across the land who are dealing with snow or, if not already, are going to be dealing with snow very soon. There are right now, this very second, 258 active bid requests related to snow removal. Over the past year, the number is way, way, well past 1,000. It's that way this year. It's that way every year. So that does it for Crazy Bids. Another episode is in the books. We appreciate you sharing, downloading, and following our show, The Big Bid Theory. Next episode, we'll have a guest on to discuss election security. If you have questions, comments about this episode, future episodes, past episodes, my email is bcolhane at bidprime.com. Please follow us on Twitter, at The Big Bid Theory. My Twitter handle is contract underscore hunter. We also, of course, as many of you know, reside on Facebook. Powered by Bid Prime for Rick Jennings and Kevin Henderson, a couple of guys who love clean water in part because it's used to make beer. <laughs> Did I? I didn't say that. Many thanks again to Todd Danielson from Avon Lake, Ohio. 
We appreciate everyone who's working towards ensuring everybody has access to clean water. This is your host, Bill Colhane. Until next time, go Gunners, Barracudas, Tigers, Bobcats, and Cubs, and we wish you all the best in growing your business. Powered by Bid Prime, we thank you for tuning in to The Big Bid Theory. From Austin, Texas, the show is produced by Bill Colhane and Jim Ward. Producer and engineer is Rick Jennings. Distribution research and production assistance by Lauren Jones and Kevin Henderson. You can find other episodes of The Big Bid Theory on platforms to include iHeart, iTunes, Spreaker, and Google Play. So much fun.